My name is Matthew Countryman, uh, I teach at the University of Michigan, and my role is, is very limited, just to, to um, start things off, to provide some introductions, uh, uh, and then I'll help with the Q&A at the end. Uh, we're hoping to um, uh, have about uh, an hour worth of presentations and then have time uh, for, for questions and answers. We're particularly honored today to have on the panel four historians who have written groundbreaking, great, groundbreaking books in the history of African American social and political movements, and their place in the histories of the nation uh, and of the world. Their charge uh, is to think beyond the state of the field framework, framework, to consider the meanings of histories of black freedom struggle for US politics and society, and in particular for the contemporary moment. How do these histories, histories remain present? How is their meaning understood and debated? What is their significance for current debates uh, over racial justice and, and equity? Before I introduce them, I, wanted to, I thought it was appropriate to read uh, just a few lines from the opening lines from the call to march for the 1963 march uh, on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, uh, which I got from the, the organizing manual for, for the march. Uh, I think they um, remind us of, of some of the timeless uh, and constant uh, 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 centrality of the issue we'll be talking about today. Uh, the, the opening reads, we march to redress old grievances and to help resolve an American crisis. That crisis is born of the twin evils of racism and economic deprivation. They rob all people, Negro and white, of dignity, self-respect, and freedom. They impose a special burden on the Negro, who is denied the right to vote, economically exploited, refused access to public accommodations, subject to inferior education, and relegated to substandard ghetto housing. Discrimination in education and apprenticeship training renders Negroes, Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, and other minorities helpless in our mechanized industrial society. Uh, let me now introduce the panelists in the order in which they will speak. To my immediate right is Claymore Carson, professor of history at Stanford University and director of Stanford's Martin Luther King Jr. Research and Education Institute. He is the author of The Definitive History of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in Struggle, SNCC, and the Black Awakening of the 1960s. Uh, of a new memoir of his years as an activist and scholar, Martin's Dream, My Journey, and the Legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., and numerous edited collections uh, of the writings of, of Dr. King. To his right uh, is Professor uh, Barbara Ransby, um, Professor of, of African American Studies, Gender and Women's Studies, and History at the University of Illinois Chicago, where she directs both the campus-wide social justice initi initiative and the Gender and Women's Studies program. She is Editor-in-Chief of Souls, a critical journey, journal of black politics, culture, and society, and the author of Essential Biographies of Ella Baker and Islanda Good Robeson. Ella Baker and the Black Freedom Mo Movement, a Radical Democratic Vision, and Islanda, the Large and Unconventional Life of Mrs. Paul Robeson. Tara Hunter is Professor of History and African American Studies at Princeton, and the author of To Joy My Freedom, Southern Black Women's Lives and Labors After the Civil War, along with uh, way too many uh, scholarly articles to mention here. Um, finally, uh, Scott Kershiki is Professor of American Culture and Asian and Pacific, American, Pacific Islander American Studies and Director of Asian and Pacific Islander American Studies at the University of Michigan. He is the author of The Shifting Grounds of Race, Black and Japanese Americans in the Making of Multi-Ethnic Los Angeles, and co-authored with Grace Lee Boggs of The Next American Revolution, Sustainable Activism for the 20, 21st Century. Scott is also a board member of the James and Grace Lee Boggs Center to Nurture Community Leadership in Detroit. Professor Carson. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, welcome to this um, wonderful session. I remember, it was only 30 years ago, <laughs> I can say that at my age, uh, when I remember suggesting that uh, we discard the term civil rights movement and move to the term black freedom struggle. Hardly anyone got on board, and um, I, I certainly didn't change the, the discourse about, uh, about the subject, but here we are, a session on freedom struggles, which only goes to show if you live long enough, <laughs> things happen. Um, in the recent memoir, Martin's Dream, My Journey and the Legacy of, of Martin Luther King, I try to look back at that time, and I recall uh, over the last 50 years since the March on Washington, 
And I recall that long before Greta Scott King selected me to edit the papers of her late husband, I had seen Snake through the critical eyes of the young, brash activists in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. I had met um, Swifty Carmichael right before the march, um, and you know, of course this summer is going to, going to be 50 years, so in 1963 I encountered Stokely and Bob Moses, and they told me about a movement that had very little to do with Martin Luther King. And indeed, they thought that Martin Luther King was trying to catch up with them rather than they following Martin Luther King. They admired him, but they were convinced that the African-American freedom struggle would have followed pretty much the same course it did even if he had never lived. At the time, I, I think I, I certainly gravitated toward that viewpoint and I, I recognize that the Montgomery bus boycott would have happened. Rosa Parks really initiated it, and the women in the Women's Political Council sustained it. Uh, the four students at Greensboro didn't rely on a call for Martin Luther King to get that movement going. And the voting rights activists like Bob Moses in the Deep South certainly weren't waiting on Martin Luther King to do what they did. But even as I rejected this, the idea of great man, charismatic theories of history, uh, these figures such as King who have supposedly changed the course of history almost single-handedly, I must admit that over the last almost 30 years since I've been looking at King, my regard for him has grown immensely. Although I still don't believe that he initiated or really played very much of a role in sustaining the mass movements of the 1950s and 60s. I think that his oratory and writings helped, um, helped our, us understand the historical and global significance of these struggles. He didn't start the Montgomery bus boycott, but he recognized from the first day that it was about much more than sitting in the front of the bus. He didn't organize the March on Washington, but his speech noted that it was concerned with much more than civil rights legislation. His ex goals extended far beyond desegregation and civil rights reform to broader conceptions of human rights and social justice. So this argument um, that I've presented about the long, even, the civil rights movement, even the long civil rights movement, being an insufficient way of understanding uh, the African-American freedom struggle. I, I think that we're just beginning to really explore the links um, between the freedom struggles in the United States and those that were going on throughout the world. And even as scholars sometimes ignore the fact that the March on Washington was for jobs as well as freedom and was a stimulus to similar kinds of acti activism elsewhere. I remember at the march, John Lewis, then the chair of SNCC, talked about one man vote, one vote being the African cry, it shall be ours also. And King, not even mentioning the civil rights, pending civil rights legislation, but going on to talk about how this country might someday live out the true meaning of its creed, all men are created equal. So I think that this notion that the freedom struggle was much broader than merely civil rights in one country, um, once you begin to look for this theme, you find that King was one of its prime advocates. Long before the um, March on Washington occurred, he had laid out an agenda that extended far beyond civil rights. Even in the late 1940s, when he was just a seminary student, still a teenager, he talked about his mission as a minister being unemployment, slums, economic insecurity, not even mentioning civil rights. 
As a graduate student at Boston University, he confided his socialist sentiments to his future wife, Coretta Scott, telling her that he would certainly welcome the day to come when there will be a nationalization of industry. Let us continue to hope, work, and pray that in the future, we will live to see a warless world, a better distribution of wealth, and a brotherhood that transcends race or color. So much for the notion that King becomes radicalized late in his life. Soon after he married Coretta in 1953, he delivered a sermon noting the deep rumbling of discontent in our world today on the part of the masses is actually a revolt against imperialism, economic exploitation, and colonialism that is perpetuated by Western civilization in all of these years. In 1957, shortly after um, the end of the Montgomery bus boycott, he delivered an Emancipation Day speech. They used to actually have these in January of 1957. And again, he talked about the bus boycott being connected to the deep rumblings of discontent in Africa, the uprisings in Asia. He saw these events as part of a birth of a new age in which colonialism and imperialism were passing away and a new order of freedom and equality would come into being, although he noted that there would be some growing pains along the way. He also described the Montgomery bus boycott in the context of a long history that went back to slavery and the Jim Crow system after slavery when African Americans felt less than human. And then he said that something happened to the Negro and gradually his plantation background gave way to urban industrial life. The Negro became, came to feel that he was somebody. His religion revealed to him that God loves all of his children and all men are made in his image. He, in that same Emancipation Day speech, he also mentioned the responsibilities African Americans would face as this old order gave way to a new order. I would say that the re first real challenge, he argued, was to rise, among the narrow, rise above the narrow confines of our individualistic concerns to the broader concerns of all humanity. You see, this new age is an age of geographical togetherness. No nation can live alone now. No in individual can live alone. We must all learn to live together or we'll all die together. Through our scientific genius, we have made the world a neighborhood. Now through our moral and spiritual genius, we must make it a brotherhood. Now just before this, Rosa Parks had transformed Martin Luther King from a social gospel minister into a civil rights leader. And I think we can all agree that during the next decade, he performed admirably in this unexpected and sometimes even unwelcome position. But the achievement of major civil rights reforms forced him to go back to his original mission. And this is what led him to, after the passage of the Voting Rights Act, to move to a slum apartment in Lawndale, neighborhood of Chicago. And rather than announcing satisfaction with civil rights gains, he went on to say, now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now we all know how that turned out. He ended up in Memphis, and he talked then about this broader conception of the movement. He identified himself not just with poor people in the United States, with poor people of all races, and the world's peasants, he called them the shirtless and barefoot people, who were engaged in a long struggle to become citizens. But what I would suggest is that this long struggle, this long struggle of the world's poor and the world's peasants, is the greatest freedom struggle the world has ever seen. It is history's greatest freedom struggle. Is these freedom struggles individually have not been neglected by historians, but these narratives have generally been recounted in isolation from one another rather than aspects as aspects of a global process 
in which tactics and strategies and principles have emerged from the bottom up as well as from the top down through the self-liberation of ordinary people as well as the influences of radical intellectuals and revolutionaries. Throughout history, radical notions of justice and rights have been asserted by the oppressed as well as articulated by our elites. And we need to study this. Now we just lay out some areas where I think that the study should focus, and I'll just mention these and we can obviously get into a conversation later. One of them would be the role of religion, particularly evangelical religion. I don't think the long freedom struggle would have happened, it might have happened without King, but it certainly could not have happened without religion. Religion was the vehicle by which the masses of people in many parts of the world gained a new conception of themselves, not yet as citizens, but as people worthy of respect and of being treated with dignity. I would also argue that mobility needs to be brought into this, this discussion. The ability of people to move toward freedom. That process, which obviously took place in terms of African-American history and the move from the south to the north, is taking place throughout the world even as we speak. And we need to understand this as a freedom movement. And finally, I would say literacy. That literacy is one of the fundamental changes over the last few hundred years that has fueled all freedom movements. And you can see this in the narratives of people like, from Frederick Douglass to Malcolm X and many others, how important the ability to read and to write has been in terms of freedom movements. So I'd like to end by just saying that um, one of the freedom songs, This Little Light of Mine, suggests a, a way of viewing this global freedom movement that has been going on for centuries. Because th people throughout the world have found they have a light inside. And they found ways to let that light shine. And I think it's our duty as historians to study that process. Thank you very much. strict time limit, but he also gave us a kind of broad mandate. Um, he suggested that we uh, should not only think about the two anniversaries that we're uh, marking this year, but also think of the long trajectory uh, of the freedom struggles. And uh, we've talked a lot about the long civil rights movement. Um, I've talked a little bit about the wide civil rights movement in terms of uh, looking at its global implications in my work with Islanda Robeson, uh, and that biography certainly took that up. But I also want to talk about, um, in King's words, the fierce urgency of now. Uh, because I took Matt's invitation to mean, let's talk about praxis um, as well as our historical research. So like Scott, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about historical memory and contemporary practice. Um, history is not a blueprint uh, for present practice. We historians know that. But we also know that there's an intimate and inextricable connection between the past and the present, between memories and legacies, traditions, perceived, manufactured, or real, and how they help to shape the terrain of struggle, resistance, and freedom making that we navigate in the here and now. Brazilian Paulo Freire talked about the practice of freedom. This is part of what we do as historians, those of us who work on racial and social justice movements. We, in our own way, engage in the practice of freedom a practice defined by the space we occupy, the knowledge we produce, how, with whom, and for whom we do our work. 
So in this context and with these questions in mind, I want to talk about work that's going on in Chicago, where I live and work and struggle. Uh, and I want to talk about the ongoing practice of freedom inside and outside of the academy. Uh, first, the landscape. Uh, the fight for public education is at the very center of the fight against uh, Mayor Rahm Emanuel's shock doctrine policies being imposed on the people of Chicago, particularly people poor, black, Latino, immigrant, and working class. <coughs> On March 27th, over 100 people, led by the fierce and fighting Chicago Teachers Union, uh, were arrested protesting the closing of 54 public schools. Since 2001, dozens of schools have been closed, um, and nearly 98% of the students affected have been black and Latino students. Gun violence in the city has taken the lives of far too many young people, and it's the same demographic impacted by the school closings. Finally, the foreclosure crisis hit Chicago hard, and I'm happy to say the anti-eviction movement sprung up and hit back, but the net result is that tens of thousands of families were left homeless or quasi-homeless. In 2009, at the peak of the crisis, there was a family losing their home to foreclosure every 22 minutes. In talking about the erosion and evisceration of public education in tandem with the rise of prisons, the gut-wrenching street violence that has dominated the headlines and the obscene reality of growing wealth disparity, that is, impunity for bank crimes and relentless punitive criminal um, prosecution for juvenile uh, victims and juvenile um, individuals who are caught up in the carceral state. One might ask the question, what does all this have to do with history? Or more precisely, what does it have to do with memory? Public memory, public perceptions of history, and the frames through which most North Americans view and engage the past, especially as it relates to notions of freedom. Well, much of what we do as historians is knit together fragments of a whole. We argue over what patches to include and which ones to leave out, where to place them, and what frame to put around it all. That frame of fragments is what we call the state of the field, for better or worse. And of course, that is what occurs in the public square as well. In the construction of public narratives about freedom and progress, there is struggle, contestation, and framing. Um, in the other major area uh, of public engagement, in, in addition to museums and exhibitions and the events that we see on um, Martin Luther King Day or during Black History Month, um, is the area of popular art most notably film and to a lesser extent television. Now, as I talk to students and non-academics and community partners about the practice of freedom, fictional narratives play a very powerful role. Historical fiction, that horrible oxymoron. Um, and there were two, there were two engaged, there were two films last year that engaged history with a vision. They take us back to the 19th century but stretch to the 21st. And I'm referring here, of course, to Steven Spielberg's Lincoln and Quentin Tarantino's Django. Spielberg and Tarantino would be quick to say that they're not historians, we would agree. Uh, they're not in the business of history, they're in the entertainment business, but they reach an enormous audience. Django grows $418 million worldwide, Lincoln grows $263 million, um, divide that by the average ticket sale, and you have a large audience. And I have really been struck both with my students and people that I work with um, in community-based struggles, the extent of the influence. I mean, people are not confused that these are fictional uh, depictions of, of struggles against slavery. Uh, but what the issues that get raised in these films frame a lot of popular um, discourse. Um, <clears throat> so I think that there are, in these films in particular and many others, three dominant popular narratives um, uh, as they relate to the black freedom movement, all three problematic. One is the linear, ascendant, triumphant narrative. We're walking the freedom road upwards and onward. Uh, there might be a few potholes or, or bumps in the road, but it's definitely progress. And I was actually reminded of this particular view of struggle. Um, unfortunately, when, when Barack Obama was elected, um, uh, Congressman John Lewis was interviewed and he uh, made this quote that, you know, Barack Obama's election is what we crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge to reach. 
And you know, many of us cringed, but it is a part of that sort of narrative of you know, an upward, singular, uh, uninterrupted, progressive journey. The other um, problematic but very popular narrative is the heroic single individual. Um, and I'm particularly sensitive to this as a biographer. I wake up in a cold sweat trying to make sure that um, I put characters in context and I put um, radical thinkers and organizers in a larger context uh, of struggle. But that is um, uh, not often what happens in popular discourse. And then the third problematic narrative, which again I think we see in a lot of popular representations, is the good guys versus the bad guys. And uh, the reason I'm, which is you know, the good guys of history and the bad guys of history, and I don't just mean King versus the Klan, I mean uh, the, 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 the good peaceful protesters and the bad, uh, the bad militants. Um, I bring up these three examples because I see them play out on the terrain of contemporary struggles. Um, the way that we talk about, critique, and wrestle with um, how we see the process uh, of social change in the practice of freedom. Uh, all of these are, are represented, I think, in the two films that I held up, Lincoln and Django. Um, through different means, Daniel Day-Lewis and Jamie Foxx were singularly triumphant heroes. Lincoln got his compromise, and Django got his bloody revenge. Um, two sets of comments from those involved in the making of those films, I think, point to the contemporary relevance. Tony Kushner, who I respect on many things, um, had an interview on MSNBC soon after the release of uh, Lincoln, and Kushner uh, uh, talked about what he had learned politically. And he had, of course, like many of us, been um, critical of, of uh, Barack Obama and the progressive agenda that we were waiting to see happen that was slow in coming. Um, but he said making of Lincoln actually uh, convinced him of the process of negotiation and compromise as being critical to a presidential um, agenda, and of course this came at a time uh, when there was a real push for less compromise and a more resolute uh, progressive agenda uh, from the president. Another uh, comment coming from Quentin Tarantino this time, provocative and audacious uh, as he often is, uh, when asked about the black critics of Django, uh, Quentin Tarantino said, uh, even for the movie's biggest black detractors, I think their children would grow up and love this movie. I think it could come, become a rite of passage for young black males, end quote. That was an LA Times um, interview, sort of a warped application of phenomenon. Um, so let's, let's skip a century and land in Lincoln's home state of Illinois and, and my um, hometown of Chicago. How do these popularized tropes and narratives about freedom, justice, uh, and social change, revenge, and compromise play out against the very real political dramas and mobilizations in cities like Chicago and my original hometown, Detroit? Instead of taking the cynical route um, and telling you how the dominant views of black struggle and freedom are ubiquitous and we are doomed, I'm going to take a different route and tell a different story. In Chicago, amidst all kinds of assaults and setbacks, cuts and killings, one of the most hopeful developments um, is, and it's grounded in some very interesting university community partnerships that are developing, um, is the restorative justice movement. Uh, it involves many organizations and has many parts, and of course it extends well beyond Chicago and beyond the U.S. borders. But in Chicago, we have a, a project at Chicago State University uh, called the Truth and Trauma Project. They do participatory action research with Southside youth, many of them survivors of violence, linking collective memory and oral histories to collective action. There's also a project called Project Nia, began as a black feminist project to confront street harassment in Chicago's Rogers Park neighborhood. Uh, they too embrace participatory research um, and link young people's activism uh, to understanding the bigger picture, both past and present. Um, I, I have to also say one of the founders of that grew out of something called the Chicago Freedom School, the curriculum of which is very much steeped uh, in lessons about the civil rights movement from Ella Baker to SNCC uh, to King uh, and Van Lou Hamer. Uh, these projects are the antithesis of Django's revenge fantasy. Uh, they are projects that bring together former gang members, kids who are survivors of violence, uh, with their elders, with people in the academy, with people in various 
uh, professions. And I must say, I can't take credit for these programs, but part of what we're trying to do through the social justice initiative that I work with um, is to build bridges with, with the organizers we work very closely with, um, and many of these people have become um, my teachers, uh, in a sense. So at the same time, these projects are grounded in deep thinking and analysis about power, injustice, and oppression. Last Saturday, we had a program that we did in conjunction with Chicago Public Radio uh, called the Global Activism Expo uh, that brought together artists, organizers, and academics around issues of restorative justice. Um, and there were over 2,000 people there. And some of these very hard issues uh, were playing out. But again, I think rejecting some of the dominant narratives uh, about uh, uh, deserving victims and undeserving victims, uh, good freedom fighters and bad freedom fighters, and really appreciating the complexities um, and nuance both of history um, as well as the, uh, the contemporary landscape. Um, I want to say a little bit, picking up off of Clay uh, Carson's remarks, um, about the importance of social class in the context of both understanding how we look back, but also how we look around um, at this moment. A lot of the work in Chicago right now is around youth violence, uh, but it's also around the growth of a prison nation and a carceral state. And in the context of those discussions, um, we return to this idea of deserving and undeserving. Uh, victims, good kids and bad kids. Um, it's something that we see, you know, in how we sort out history and how we often sort out um, uh, political uh, narratives today. Um, the Hadia P Pendleton case is a good example of that. And, and just in the newspaper yesterday, Michelle Obama went to Chicago again, holding up the case of the young woman who was an honor student, a majorette, uh, performed at the inauguration, uh, who was killed tragically, tragically. Uh, in Chicago when she returned. Um, one of the newspapers in Chicago, the Sun-Times, had a headline that I'll never forget. The ugly problem has now, now has a pretty face. And referring to this young woman as, you know, really a tragic victim, but what I'm struck by is the contrast with um, the way that she's described versus how other kids, including the kids who get caught up in, you know, on the other side uh, of of these kinds of scenarios. The shooters that they've arrested are 18 and 20. Um, there are 140 charges that they're facing. And I think what the restorative justice movement challenges us to do, in the same way that many of the um, activists and leaders and critical thinkers uh, of the civil rights era did, um, is to think about new set of values that govern the movements that we uh, want to build. That movements can't be built on revenge and punishment, um, but issues of reflection, accountability, community, um, and restitution. Another strength of this movement, and I'm, I'm wrapping up, but another strength of this movement is also, the restorative justice movement, is also something I, I see in the work of, of Grace Lee Boggs and others um, who have been you know, such valiant crusaders doing work in Detroit, um, is that the focus on local issues and local solutions has also not um, absolve the state of a certain accountability. And I think this is a critical uh, variable that a lot of times uh, focused on, you know, sort of inward focus, and we saw this in the movements of the 60s when people sort of retreated to uh, a self-help strategy, but that strategy often left the state off the hook in terms of its accountability, responsibility, um, and resources. So the restorative justice movement in Chicago has worked um, very closely with a number of anti-privatization uh, campaigns and young people have been in the lead of that. Organizations that most of you have never heard of, Fearless Leadership by Youth, Chicago Freedom School, the Black Youth Project, um, LTAB, the Louder Than a Bomb Poetry Slam, are all young people who are in some ways the heirs of uh, Bob Moses and Diane Nash and many of the young people in SNCC on a very, very different um, and very dangerous in its own way political terrain. Uh, they are both con uh, confronting systemic and structural racism uh, and violence and trying to build a new creative set um, of values that will uh, nourish and sustain them uh, as they go forward. The final thing I, I want to say is just a little bit about um, my own work and lessons that I've extracted as an activist from my work as a historian of the black freedom movement. 
probably one of the biggest lessons I take from my work on Ella Baker is the importance of um, doing work as outsiders within. And so this current project, it's not a book project, it's a practice project, uh, is uh, called the Social Justice Initiative. And there's a group of us in Chicago at University of Illinois at Chicago um, that are doing engaged working groups. Uh, we have a pop-up Just Art Gallery. We have fellows uh, who come in and partner with community thinkers. Um, we have a summer institute. And it's really trying to think of new forms of knowledge production, uh, trying to open up the space of the academy, and trying to break down some of the disciplinary silos, and to really forge a sense of what does praxis uh, mean in the context of still doing uh, rigorous and serious uh, intellectual work. And I must say, in the context of this work, I have learned as much from uh, the Fannie Lou Hamers uh, of this generation uh, and that as, I, as I have from, uh, from you know, very uh, smart and brilliant and committed colleagues. And so I think part of the challenge is to see what the legacy of the long civil rights and black freedom movement is uh, for those of us today who still have that dream. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good Wonderful to see such a robust crowd on the first day of the OAH. As a 19th, 19th century historian on the panel, I want to take us back to an earlier time. And I want to start with a quote from Frederick Douglass. In 1849, in a speech at Boston's Faneuil Hall, Douglass said that he would, quote, welcome the news that the slaves had risen, and that the sable arms which had been engaged in beautifying and adorning the South were engaged in spreading death and devastation there." End of quote. Douglas spoke as a fugitive slave who, with initial hesitation by the late 1840s, was willing to support armed struggle and collective resistance as a necessary path to ending slavery. He had no idea that less than a decade and a half later, the Civil War would open up exactly this opportunity. It should not be surprising then that at the outset of the war, Douglas and other African Americans were primed to interpret the war in this way. While Douglas had not predicted a Civil War, other blacks, other black radicals in particular, like David Walker, had prophesied something quite similar in 1829. Walker believed that God would ultimately seek vengeance against the nation, which was led and run by slave owners. Walker stated that he will, quote, cause them to rise up one against another, to be split and divided, and to oppress each other, and sometimes to open hostilities with sword in hand. Historian Vincent Harding has captured the essence of David Walker's radical prophecies and other African Americans' understanding of the purpose of the Civil War by describing it this way, as, quote, the ultimate justification of the costly freedom movement, a welcome vindication of the trust in providence, end of quote. Black deliverance was expected, even if long in coming. I raise the names of Frederick Douglass and David Walker to remind us of the deep-rooted freedom movement that preceded the Civil War. It was a movement defined by various acts of resistance and rebellion that differed from the organized mass protests that we associate with the March on Washington and the Civil Rights Movement. It was a movement that began on the slave ships during the Middle Passage and continued in towns and farms and plantations throughout the slaveholding states. Untold numbers of, of people of African descent and dedicated allies lost their lives in this struggle for literal freedom, for the basic rights of human dignity, and for the rights of citizenship. That movement escalated very soon after the first shots were fired of the Civil War and most especially as the Union Army made its way across Confederate territories. 
Slaves followed in the foot trails of soldiers, and with poetic justice, Union encampments at Fort Monroe, Virginia, were the places where slaves first fled to freedom, which had been the place where the first Africans had been enslaved in 1619. First by trickle and then by flood, thousands made their way into Union lines in search of refuge. Their flight forced the federal government to begin implementing military policies to advance emancipation. When Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation on the 1st of January in 1863, it marked an important turning point for supporters and activists engaged in the long freedom struggle. Prior to the Civil War, the federal government had not been active allies of slaves, to put it mildly. The Constitution upheld the protection of slavery in places where it already existed. Slave owners had dominated the federal government. They controlled the presidency almost without interruption, going back to George Washington until the election of Abraham Lincoln. They dominated Congress and the Supreme Court for much of this time as well. Slavery had been crucial to the sustenance of the American economy and society since its earliest days. The Emancipation Proclamation marked an important break with that legacy. It declared that slaves in Confederate controlled territories henceforth shall be free. It also charged the executive branch, including the military, with recognizing and maintaining the freedom of said persons. The proclamation represented a significant, unprecedented convergence between the federal government and the black freedom movement. Slaves, ex-slaves, free blacks, and their, and their allies seized upon this moment to turn the war to save the Union into a war to end slavery. It took the ratification of the 13th Amendment to the Constitution to put the final nail in the coffin to end legal bondage in December of 1865. The destruction of slavery was no less than one of the most monumental events in world history. African Americans gained back their self-ownership as billions of dollars in property of white Southerners were liquidated. The passage of the 14th Amendment made former slaves and all African Americans citizens for the first time. It put the jurisdiction of citizenship under the helm of the federal government beyond the dictates of the states. But not only were slaves freed, free labor instituted, and citizenship rights granted, the entire nation was transformed. And yet, in reality, African Americans only achieved a kind of freedom, as they were not able to fully secure equal rights. Those who believed in and worked for freedom could not rest. Another century of struggle for full equality was set in motion. At the center of that struggle were contests over basic economic and political rights, most especially the, the fight for free labor, land ownership, and the right to vote. That the federal government did not do more to facilitate and protect black economic and political rights as the Emancipation Proclamation gestured had severe and enduring repercussions. After the end of Reconstruction, African Americans became locked in a new system of subjugation, of sharecropping, crop liens, debt peonage, and Jim Crow. Those who managed to buy land could rarely hold on for more than one generation. They were met with violence from vigilante groups and organizations like the Ku Klux Klan. This was all the more consequential for long-term equality, as landed wealth and home ownership had been historical resources for mobility for American families. 100 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, the March on Washington in 1963 marked another important moment in the long freedom movement. Of course, as historians, we have not forgotten, as Professor Clay Carson just mentioned as well, that the event was called the March on Washington for Jobs 
and freedom. Two of the key organizers of the event, Bayard Rustin and A. Philip Randolph, had both hoped to reinvigorate the alliance between the labor movement and civil rights activists. Organizers made sure to include unemployed people as well as union members at the march. Many African American workers at the time were marginalized by the collapse of the agricultural economy. Others faced devastating job losses as manufacturing plants introduced automation and fled to low-wage regions. Several speakers at the march talked about the need for fair employment and full employment to redress discrimination in housing, education, and public accommodations. And yet the mainstream media reported very little about these themes. Rather, the highlight of the day was a now famous I Have a Dream speech delivered by Martin Luther King Jr. Though King himself did not ignore economic issues. Five years later, while promoting the Poor People's Campaign in Memphis, Tennessee, which included the goal of full employment for all workers, King would lose his life. The civil rights movement on the whole secured more freedom than jobs. Although African Americans have made great strides individually and as a group, race, racial and economic inequalities are still intertwined. Employment figures are a stark indication of this unrelenting trend. The unemployment rate in March of this year for African Americans, according to the U.S. Department of Labor, was 13.3%, almost double the national rate. The black unemployment rate has been above 10% over the past 50 years, and consistently twice that of whites. Whereas white workers have experienced short periods of high unemployment, African Americans have experienced persistently high rates. But even these figures only give us a partial picture of the dire status of African Americans in the economy. For each decade since 1940, black men in particular have experienced increases in permanent unemployment. 9.5% in 1940, 16.8% in 1960, 1950, 22.3% in 1960, 25% in 1990, 34% in 2000. Since the mid 20th century, in other words, African Americans have been disproportionately kicked out of the labor market entirely. This is one of the deepest ironies of the post-civil rights era that scholars have yet to fully analyze and policymakers have yet to address. In short, the future for freedom seemed bright at the time of the Emancipation Proclamation and brighter still at the March on Washington. But the promises and the policies that followed in their wake have yet to be fully realized. We can only imagine what Frederick Douglass and David Walker would say if they were alive today. Thank you. Good afternoon. So I'd also like to thank the conference committee for organizing this wonderful session. Uh, when I received the invitation from Tom Guillermo, uh, I was of course honored and excited to be included with such distinguished presenters. But then fear rapidly set in as I pondered the immensity of this theme, freedom struggles spanning the anniversaries of both 1963 and 1863. And for a while, the best framework I could come up with was the really long civil rights movement. Uh, so my talk will mostly reflect my background in 20th century history, but I want to open with Karl Polanyi's reflections on the idea of freedom in the 19th century, which struck me as particularly salient as I was teaching David Harvey's neoliberalism book this semester. So near the end of the Great Transformation, Polanyi asserts that the classic liberal concept of freedom had, quote, degenerated into mere advocacy of free enterprise. 
and that the idea of freedom as an unregulated, unregulated market, divorced from politics and guided by material self-interest, had, quote, produced freedom at the cost of justice and security, end of quote. Such a warped concept of freedom, he argued, and keep in mind he's publishing this in the middle of World War II, quote, leaves no alternative but either to remain faithful to an illusion, illusionary idea of freedom and deny the reality of society, or to accept that reality and reject the idea of freedom. The first is the liberals' conclusion, the latter the fascists, end quote. Of course, through Keynesianism and the New Deal, America found a middle path between the laissez-faire market system and fascism. A managed form of capitalism that in its most progressive guise assumed the form of social democracy. More commonly, mid-20th century Americans embraced an era of liberal growth policies and social reform that enabled a new notion of the American dream. But in this context, the civil rights freedom struggles were a stark reminder that the vast post-war expansion of the middle class produced neither shared prosperity nor equal access to liberty and mobility. Now the scholarship of the long civil rights movement has of course offered us crucial reminder that the struggle to negate segregation was simultaneously an affirmative call for jobs and economic justice. Through an address delivered here uh, when George W. Bush was standing for re-election, Jacqueline Dowd Hall's stinging rebuke of the valorization of Martin Luther King, quote, frozen in 63, proclaimed I have a dream, and the sanitized narrative of the short civil rights movement was a timely retort to the whitewashing of history and facile celebration of American exceptionalism that defined the neoconservative apex. Nearly a decade later, however, we might ask, what have we since learned, seeing the nation governed by an African-American president who is driven to run by the fierce urgency of now, but has not been able to reverse the trend toward widening racial disparity and structural inequality? What has become more apparent is a bipartisan trend, the rise of neoliberal measures that have increasingly eroded that middle pathway between laissez-faire capitalism and authoritarianism. For urban African-American communities that have been uh, at the center of my work, conditions of life have grown increasingly dire. Deindustrialization, deunionization, privatization, gentrification, and financial schemes of the austere, usury, and punitive types have conspired to undermine black economic progress. We are in the midst of a tectonic shift one that mandates we pay careful attention to the new contradictions and openings that challenge us to re-examine history. For my part, through my previous writings on Los Angeles, I sought to understand how the rise of multiculturalism and globalization remade the political, economic, and cultural dynamics of race, presenting one path to the neoliberal order we are now living in. Since then, I have moved to Detroit, becoming witness to the advanced stage of the urban crisis, one which presents a complementary window into the neoliberal order. Seven decades ago, Detroit was the arsenal of democracy, a place that exemplified the promise of industrial unionism and social democracy. Fifty years ago, and two months before the March on Washington, Detroiters were at the forefront of the northern, northern freedom struggle. 200,000 Detroiters marched down Woodward Avenue, and Motown was the setting for Dr. King's I Have a Dream right here in Detroit speech. Just four years later, Detroit became the exemplar of rebellion, and in the aftermath, Coleman Young was elected mayor, as Detroit embodied the promise of black political empowerment, but jobs were rapidly dis disappearing. Today, Detroit exhibits the stunning effects of white flight and capital flight, evinced by a landscape scarred with abandonment and blight. More than one-third of the city's footprint now consists of vacant lots and burned-out structures, and the real rate of unemployment has been estimated to be 50%. Vultures are swarming overhead. In a would-be serious proposal, some leading political and business figures from the GOP and Chamber of Commerce have proposed to purchase Belle Isle, Detroit's island version of uh, Frederick Law Olmsted Central Park, purchase it from the city and turn it into a private commonwealth for millionaires uh, inspired by Atlas Shrugged. <clears throat> and rather than leveling, the education system is aggravating polarization. Two-thirds of the Detroit public school system's buildings have been shuttered within the past decade, 200 in total. Blacks comprise 83% of Detroit's population, 14% of the statewide population, 
but only 4% of the University of Michigan student body. Now, Detroiters tend to be either invisible, a casualty of the public's post-racial blind spot, or hyper-visible through a racialized discourse of pathology, the worst example of the so-called excesses of freedom. In both instances, the city's extreme conditions render it exceptional. But borrowing from Lonnie Guineer and Gerald Torres, I submit we are best advised to, do Detroit, to view Detroit as the miners' canary. Of course, as Barbara pointed out, you don't need to go to Detroit to see how structural inequality and racism are manifested through housing foreclosures, school closures, police brutality, or the criminalization of youth. But a new and disturbing pattern is being set in the city of Detroit and the state of Michigan right now, one that puts the struggle for freedom in a new perspective. In the face of declining population and revenues, the city of Detroit has been declared to be on the brink of insolvency not only owing to mounting debts, but also because the city squandered nearly a half billion dollars in fees to Wall Street for servicing those debts over the past eight years. As a result, Michigan's Governor Rick Snyder has appointed an emergency manager to rule Detroit. This means that the one-time arsenal of democracy is now controlled by an unelected autocratic ruler who has assumed the powers of both the mayor and city council while answering only to the governor and, of course, the Wall Street bond rating agencies. We should note that the governor announced this just two days after Justice Scalia chastised the Voting Rights Act as, quote, the perpetuation of racial entitlement. As a result, half of Michigan's black residents currently live in cities that have been taken over by emergency managers, whose principal task is to accelerate layoffs, budget cuts, benefits reductions, and the sale of public assets measures deemed too risky for any official held accountable to the voters. Widening economic equality is thus complemented by political disenfranchisement. As such, black economic status and political standing are being simultaneously undermined. With those measures implemented in response to the civil rights and black power movements, affirmative action, minority set-asides, community control, voting rights being stripped away. Though the Obama era has been marked by some real forward strides, societal commitment to diversity is increasingly symbolized by the incorporation of individuals of color into a recomprised elite that is now multicultural and global. And so in this context, it would be real easy to see history uh, as a through the narrative uh, lens of loss. But it's important to remember that power is not merely repressive, it is creative. And though freedom struggles must resist where necessary, they are ultimately forward-looking in character at their best, they expand the realm of the possible. In Detroit, this means seeing opportunity within crisis. The end of reform is heightening contradictions, removing that reformist middle path, and pushing us back toward 19th century conditions of freedom for the haves and disenfranchisement of the have-nots. But the end of reform is also stripping away illusions, reminding Detroiters how the earth became commodified as land, how work became commodified as labor, how local sustainable economies were eclipsed by the power of global commerce and finance, and how in the eyes of the haves and have-mores, democracy has always been a radical and dangerous concept. In the aftermath of industrial collapse and amid the dismantling of the public sector, a new model of visionary community organizing has developed in Detroit, one which advances the struggle for freedom through local self-sufficiency and neighborhood self-governance, putting forward new models of urban agriculture, craft production, community-based freedom schooling, nonviolent conflict resolution, restorative justice, healing arts, cooperative ownership, and non-commercial development. Deliberately small scale, but increasingly gathering momentum, these new grassroots movements are bringing Detroit activists into dialogue with those challenging IMF dictates and multinational hegemony in the global south. They draw strength from what uh, Diane Nash has called agapeic energy and seek to actualize a horizontal model of beloved community. In this manner, they are establishing a new way to connect the present to a forward-looking history of freedom struggles. As Grace Lee Boggs argues in our co-authored book, quote, radical social change must be viewed as a two-sided transformational process of ourselves and of our institutions, a process requiring protect, protracted struggle and not just a D-Day replacement of one set of rulers with another. Montgomery bus boycott was the first struggle by an oppressed people in Western society from this new philosophical slash political perspective. 
practicing methods of nonviolence that transform themselves and increase the good rather than the evil in the world, always bearing in mind that their goal was not only desegregating the buses but creating the beloved community, they inspired the human identity and ecological movements which over the past 40 years have been creating a new civil society in the United States." End of quote. No doubt we are living in a moment of rupture, as are the fallible guardians of the global economy. But our histories can trace a continuous lineage of freedom struggles that go beyond lamenting progress awarded, unfulfilled promises, or the now vanishing gains of the civil rights movement. This is a lineage marked by the struggle for a new concept of freedom and a new vision of social transformation, one that ultimately recognizing, recognizes that the most revolutionary struggle is the struggle to reinvent revolution itself. Thank you.